uh, I will speak in English and in Portuguese, yeah? Ok. Então, bom dia a todos. Bem-vindo à, à palestra de hoje, que é do professor Nayara Naswami Balakrishnan, da Universidade de McMaster, em, no Ontário, do Canadá. E é, ele é professor... É, é, Distinguished University Professor, né? Professor de Universidade Distinguido, é o título do senhor uh, uh, Balakrishna. Uh, eu acredito que a maioria conhece o currículo extenso do professor, um, que teve várias um, um, uh, honras uh, no, na sua carreira. Um, é membro da uh, Associação Estatística uh, dos Estados Unidos, americana, né? É, do in, in, Instituto Internacional de, de é, Estatística Matemática da, as, é, da é, Sociedade Estatística do Canadá. É, então, é, é, eu vou agora traduzir para o inglês o que eu falei, né, da minha apresentação do professor Balakrishnan. Então, uh, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I, uh, I have the honor to present uh, today uh, uh, Professor Nayara Naswami Balakrishna, a Distinguished University Professor of McMaster University in, of Ontario, Canada. And um, um, he has a, a long curriculum. I think most of you know the curriculum, so I just uh, told, told, uh, talked about some honors. Um, uh, uh, Professor Balakrishnan will today talk about accelerated live testing of one-shot devices, data collection and analysis. And uh, without much further ado, I will ask please uh, Professor Balakrishnan to start uh, his presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Alexander and Jeremiah. Um, Thank you, first of all, for inviting. Jeremiah has wrote to me several months ago. I had even forgotten until he reminded me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about this topic. I don't think I have given a talk on this topic in Brazil. That's one reason I chose this topic. The other reason I chose this topic is also, you see the date there, 28 July, 2020. This was during the pandemic. Uh, I published a book um, subsequently uh, by John Wiley and Sons with the same title. So I'm going to talk about this and a lot of the details that I'm going to give can be found in the textbook. Now, I want to take a few minutes to explain how this problem came about. In 2009 or 2008, I was driving my car on the highway and uh, uh, it, I was going at 90 kilometers an hour. The speed limit was 80 kilometers an hour. And uh, all of a sudden, a young lady uh, just came in front of me without any warning. I tried to avoid hitting her, but I could not uh, avoid because the speed uh, and the distance I had, I could not stop. So we had a head-on collision and she had a Toyota Corolla and I had a Volvo. And after the accident, I noticed that uh, she got seriously hurt because her airbags uh, did not function. And uh, in my car, uh, the Volvo, I had a passenger side airbag, driver's airbag, side airbags, all of them got deployed. I could get out without a scratch in my body but in her case, she got seriously hurt. I pulled her out and uh, called the ambulance. And then the police came and the two of us were taken to the hospital for a checkup. And uh, she got charged for um, negligent driving. And she was a young lady, like my daughter's age, 18 or 19 years old. <clears throat> While I was coming back from the hospital to home by the ambulance, I was thinking to myself, how would one evaluate the reliability of airbags? For example, 
you have you have a car it may be a honda it may be a toyota it may be a fiat whatever it is it has airbags how do you know the reliability of airbags how does one collect the information about this and at that time i had a phd student by name mano ling who had just joined and uh, so he wrote to me that uh, i want to meet with you to decide on a topic so i wrote to him very excited saying that i have thought of a problem when i was in the ambulance i think we should meet next week i will explain to you the problem when we can work on it and that turned out to be the start of this topic so from 2009 on i have published more than 30 or 40 papers on one shot devices and that is what i am the book is about and i am going to go to full screen and go over what i am going to talk about in detail uh, by the way uh, both uh, jeremiah and alexander uh, you tell me when i should uh, stop so i can stop i don't have to complete the whole talk uh, it's a long presentation but you tell me when you are all tired and you want me to stop talking i can close the session so this is the text this is the research monograph i told you about accelerated life testing of uh, one shot devices and if you see here uh, there are this is a, a a car inside picture and uh, this is exactly what it was in this lady's car it was a toyota corolla and uh, you see that the passenger side airbag successfully deployed in collision but the driver seat airbag did not deploy so uh, that's a failure this is a success and of course how do you evaluate information on the reliability of one uh, of airbags that is the question and these are my co-authors both are both of them are my phd students former phd students now they are professors so uh, and uh, uh, on you so he is now at university of waterloo mano ling is at the university of hong kong so here is an outline and you can see that i have a long laundry list of things that i want to talk about because there are many different angles that you can focus on the idea is it is like a short course once you go through this lecture you will find what are all the things that are done then you can think about further problems or some modifications to it so first i am going to start with what is a one shot device uh, whenever i uh, talk to people they don't know what a one shot device is one shot device is a device that gets destroyed uh, during usual operating conditions and they can perform their intended function only once like for example airbags once you have a crash the airbag opens and it protects you after that the airbag cannot be reused it has to be removed a new airbag has to be installed and in this case what is interesting is that you will never observe a lifetime this is a, even though it is a lifetime data analysis you will never observe a lifetime data you will never observe the actual lifetime all you will observe is whether the airbag was a success or a failure like in the picture that i showed there were two airbags all in this crash all i notice is one airbag succeeded another airbag failed that's all i know so examples it is not only airbags it turns out that many many devices that are commonly used are one shot devices for example electro explosive devices in mining you use electro explosives a dynamite for example and you ignite them sometimes the electro explosives don't function they are failure you have fire extinguishers at home you have munitions you have rockets vehicle airbags devices under destructive life test any destructive life test that you do the item gets destroyed as soon as it is operated 
and in which case you always get only a success or a failure. But uh, the problem with it is that most of these uh, one-shot devices may be highly reliable. So therefore, you cannot observe many failure under normal operating conditions. So for example, in car airbags, if you crash at 10 kilometers an hour, 20 kilometers an hour, the airbags won't e explode. They won't uh, su succeed because the stress was not sufficient. So what you do in order to evaluate the reliability of such one-shot devices, you use an accelerated life testing. What is an accelerated life test? It is a fish, it is meant for capturing valuable lifetime information in a short experimental time. It is meant to induce more failure. And you do that by using higher than normal stress level to induce early failures. So if, for example, I run the car at 50 kilometers an hour and crash into a tree, that is an accelerated life test at normal speed that they would test it at would be 20 or 30 kilometers an hour. But there may not be many failures in this case or successes in this case. So you use higher than normal stress levels. And then what you do is you extrapolate. You extrapolate from the data you obtained at the elevated stress levels to talk about the estimation of the reliability under normal operating conditions. And this is usually done by a link function. And there are many uh, reliability link functions. Need not be log linear link functions or logistic link function. For example, there is something called power law model, Arrhenius model, etc. These are all thermodynamic principles that are used to link the stress factor to the lifetime data. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with a bunch of data. And I want to show you that these are real life data that are just one shot devices. The first data, it is a data on electro explosive devices under sea salt. What is sea salt? Sea salt means constant stress accelerated life test. So for example, uh, if the normal speed at which uh, they want to evaluate the functioning of the car airbag is 30 kilometers an hour, you fix 50 kilometers an hour and it's a constant stress. And it is accelerated because you are using a higher than normal speed. And uh, in this particular case, this is a electro explosive devices and they use a uh, temperature in KIPS as the stress factor. So, I have here nine test groups, and I have here the temperature, 308 kips, 318 kips, 328 kips, et cetera, number of samples that were tested under each test group, and the number of failures. And here, the inspection time. The inspection time says, when do you declare a failure? For example, inspection time is important in a airbag. Suppose the car, uh, car accident occurs. What you want to do is declare a success or a failure within five seconds after the accident. The car airbag should function within five seconds. There is nothing to be gained if it functions after 30 seconds, because by that time, the driver may have been injured or the passengers may have been injured. So the inspection time is the time at which they test whether the unit succeeded or failed. Here is a second data. This is called as, this is originally due to Marvin Zellen. It was published in 1959. It is a failure records on glass capacitors. Here again, it is a constant stress accelerated life test. You will see repeatedly this phrase and another one called yes salt sea salt and the salt. Sea salt means it's a constant stress. Yes salt means it's a step stress. So that means that it is increased, uh, the stress is increased at, in steps and the test is collecting data at different stress levels. 
In this example, I have two stress factors. In the previous one, I had only one stress factor, temperature. And here, I have the temperature and the voltage. So the inspection time, again, is given here. And the number of samples tested, the number of failures. But notice here, the lifetime data is not observed. It can also arise in biology. This is a tumorogenicity experiment. This is a data that was given by Cordell and Nelson in a paper in biometrics. A tumorogenicity experiment is they have a lab mice, number of mice, and they inject them with a dosage, and the dosage of the chemical that they use is in per parts per million. So for example, I have 24 test groups here, and the dosage, some of them, first five, they injected with 60 parts per million. The next 13 were injected with 120, 200, and 400 parts per million. Then the number of mice that were sacrificed. So that means after 48 months, 9.33 uh, months, that's the inspection time. After 9.33 months, that is, uh, three, uh, for example, 280 days. After 280 days, 48 mice were sacrificed, which were injected with uh, 60 parts per million dosage. One of them died with tumor. And the remaining 47 did not uh, uh, have tumor. So what you may want to do here is, once again, use one-shot device testing data. Here is a data from Greece-based magnetorheological fluid test, but this is under a S-salt. S-salt means step stress accelerated life test. And I want to explain what that is. The stress factor here is a temperature. But you see here, stage one was the units were tested at 333 kips as a temperature, but stage two, was 339, stage three was 345. So there were four stages. At each stage, the temperature was increased by six skips. The number of samples that were tested are all the same, number of failures observed, and the inspection time for the grease-based fluid uh, is uh, measured. There is another data. This data is called ED01 experimental data. You can find it in a Google search. And here, the number of mice sacrificed died without tumor, died with tumor from the ED01 experimental data. And I have given once again the inspection time in months. This is a high dose of 2AAF treatment that or chemical that was injected somewhere um, nominal that group, which means they were not injected with the chemical, some were injected with the chemical. So you can ask, has the chemical has the potency, uh, propensity to generate more tumors? The number of mice that were sacrificed, then you ask how many of them died without tumor? How many of them died with tumor? So you may be able to think of them as uh, using the tumor, tumorogenicity, whether you want to know whether the incidence of tumor increases with the dosage and as compared to the nominal level. Uh, this is a, a, a famous data, Berlin et al. data. It's a survival data. It's a serial sacrifice data on the presence or absence of two disease categories. There is one called thymic lymphoma, the other one is uh, all other diseases combined. And there are 14 test groups. These are the sacrifice days. And you also want to know whether the covariate was gamma radiation, where they injected, where they exposed to gamma radiation, yes or no, there were two groups. Number of mice, and uh, you sacrifice them, you ask, healthy mice were 58, died with thymic lymphoma alone, died due to all other diseases, and died due to thymic lymphoma and some other related cause. This is a say, case of one-shot device with competing risks. So towards the end of the talk, if time permits, I will talk about this particular problem 
where you can think of competing risk model for one shot device. So those are the re real life data that I will keep bringing in order to show you how the results look like. So now I'm going to start with the inferential methods. What is a typical form of one shot device data under a constant stress accelerated life test? I think of multiple accelerating factors. For example, I have stress levels here. I assume there are J stress factors. The first group, the J stress factors are at different levels, X11, X12, X1J. I inspect them at time tau one and number of devices I test is K1 out of which number of failures is N1. And I have I testing conditions J stress factors and J stress levels, I inspection times, I numbers of tested devices, I numbers of failures that I have observed. So clearly the likelihood function is going to take the typical binomial form. Either the devices failed or the devices did not fail. So I will have a typical binomial form where I put the observed likelihood function is if the airbag did not function. So that means the device was left censored. So that means the lifetime must have been smaller than the inspection time. So at the inspection time or test time tau i, I should have the lifetime to be smaller than tau i and ni of them failed. So that will be f to the power ni the remaining Ki minus Ni function, the airbags e exploded, they function. So therefore their lifetime must be after the inspection time, which is the reliability function. So Z is the given data. What are the data? I need the inspection times tau I, I need Ki, the number of units that were tested, and I need Ni, the number of units that failed, Xi are the covariates, and it is a constant stress accelerated life test. And the reliability function is R, which is a survival function. That is the reliability at inspection time tau i. Now notice, this is an extreme case of censored data. All the data are censored. Either they are left censored, in which case you have capital F, or they are right censored, in which case you have capital R. If the airbag failed, I know the lifetime was smaller than the inspection time. If the airbag succeeded, then I know the lifetime is larger than tau i. So how does the EM algorithm, this is a typical case of EM algorithm. In fact, it is extremely useful because the whole data is censored. So the E step will ask, how do I have to impute the missing data and I need the expectations. It is clear that the expectations are not all going to be simple because when I take the log of this, I will have the left truncated distribution, the right truncated distribution. So I need to work with expectations on both. And the M step will ask that with the imputed values, replacing the, uh, the missing data, I will maximize and of course, the reliability engineers commonly work with four lifetime models. They are exponential, gamma, Weibull and log normal. You bring any other distribution to a reliability engineer, they are not happy. Hello? Is there a question? No. Uh, I don't yeah. think so, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, and then I'm, that is a EM algorithm can be implemented. By the way, in the book, there is a separate section for each model. And also in the book, the novel feature of it is, we have provided the R code and the, how the R code can be implemented and what kind of results you get, how you interpret them. So, uh, of course, once we have the point estimation, we can construct a confidence interval, but normally we teach in statistical inference course, the students to use asymptotic normality of the MLEs. Here, 
we have the asymptotic normality we can establish using lipschitz conditions but the asymptotic uh, confidence intervals may not be reliable partly because the uh, reliability experiments do not involve thousands of units for testing small number of units are tested so there are couple of things you can do rather than pivoting the parameter phi by using the mle phi hat and then using the asymptotic normality since we are dealing with lifetime data we want confidence interval for reliability function so if somebody wants to know i have bought a 4 year old car a toyota corolla and this has not been in an accident at all so i want to know what is its reliability from one year from now so that means you want to look at the reliability at the age of 5 years old or of 5 so that is the function that you want to evaluate and uh, in which case we know the r of t is always between 0 and 1 so rather than using the mle directly you can use a logit transformation construct a confidence interval for the logit function of r of t and then invert it the advantage of this is that this confidence interval will always be in the interval 0 to 1 whereas this confidence interval is not bound in the interval 0 to 1 same thing you can do with other things quantiles mean lifetime if i want to know what is the mean lifetime instead of using this method i can use the log transformation of mean which will be from minus infinity to plus infinity use the delta method to get the confidence interval and invert it and that confidence interval will always be in the interval 0 to 1 not 0 to infinity not only it keeps the intervals it also has better features coverage probabilities are better because this logit transformation and log transformations avoid skewness in the pivotal quantities and that is an advantage for these methods so here i give you a small simulation study i took an exponential lifetime distribution i have two accelerated life conditions 25 degrees and 35 degrees celsius and i am interested in estimating the mean lifetime theta e means mean lifetime under exponential distribution the model parameter can include everything whatever i have used the link functions they it can include all the parameters the mean lifetime mu e the reliability under normal operating conditions of 25 and 35 i have given different sample sizes k remember k is the sample size here and i have given here the bias and the root mean square error why i have three parameters remember that i have a link function because i have two stress factors one corresponding to 20 another one corresponding to 25 i have 25 and 35 as the normal but i tested the data at 25 and 30 and i want to ex extrapolate so i use mean lifetime theta e is a positive quantity so i use a log linear link function it has a intercept it has a slope for the first covariate slope for the second covariate and i have given here the true values the true value of the mean lifetime is 66.686 days the reliability at a mission time 10 10 years is 0.799 the reliability at 20 is 0.638 you can see that the bias is all very close to zero and it tells you that uh, the estimates are almost unbiased even in the case of small sample sizes now i give you the coverage probability and this gives you a whole different picture in the same i use the same setting as before and now i am looking at the 95% confidence intervals for the model parameter the mean lifetime and the reliability function you notice here that the coverage probability based on the asymptotic method is quite low compared to 90% it is only 89% but the same data with the same sample size k if i use the log link or the logit link in order to change the pivot for the construction of confidence interval 
they can attain the norm, nominal confidence level of 95% even in small sample size of 10. This is why I was telling statisticians usually use the asymptotic theory for MLEs, but depending on the quantity you want to construct the confidence interval for, a cleverer approach will be to use some kind of transformation. Some of these transformations like a logic transformation, log linear transformation, et cetera, can eliminate uh, skewness in the pivots distribution in small sample sizes and can give you better coverage probabilities, even in small sample sizes. Now I take the electro explosive device data that was given in this paper in 2009, Fan et al. And uh, now, which distribution should I use? Because you have no data. So you cannot use a goodness of fit to say that I have a gamma or a viable distribution because there is no way to model validate. So model validation is out the window because you have no lifetime data. Complete data is censored. So here I demonstrate, I assume the gamma distribution, I assume the viable distribution. The electro-explosive device data, I have two parameters for a gamma and the two parameters for a Bible. So they have the same number of parameters. Since the say, shape and scale parameters are both positive, I use a log linear link function for both of them. So there will be an intercept and slope for the scale parameter, intercept and slope for the shape parameter. I estimate the mean lifetime under gamma, the reliability function at nominal at nominal time at 20. So this is the reliability function that I want to estimate. Notice that the data was very small of size nine. <clears throat> so the reliability estimate turns out to be 69.6%, but the asymptotic confidence interval gives you a confidence interval from 0.3 to beyond one. But we have to truncate it at one because it's a reliability function. But if you use the logic transformation, you get a confidence interval always within the interval zero to one. You should not worry why this confidence interval is so wide. That is because we have only a data based on nine units that are being tested. So of course, if we have a larger data, our inference will be more precise. We can put a Bayesian framework. The Bayesian framework has a problem here. The problem is, how do I specify the prior? That's a question. For example, if I am interested in estimating, this is something that uh, someone like Josemar will have very good idea about. For example, if I work with log linear link function here, I have four parameters. Typically, you go to Bayesian inference. What they will do, if I'm not mistaken, is say that there is an intercept and slope for the scale parameter intercept and slope for the shape parameter. So I have four parameters. Let us put a four dimensional multivariate normal distribution with uh, some mean vector that comes from a priori information. Then you put a variance covariance matrix, which is often taken to be diagonal, which means you have independent prior. But that assumes that you are putting the prior on the model parameter theta. But my aim is not a in the estimation of theta, I really don't care what are A0, A1, B0, B1. I may be interested only in estimating the reliability at some mission time. So for example, if an automobile seller sells and gives a warranty that I give coverage for four years, they are interested only in knowing what is the reliability at the age of four years old in a car. They are not interested in what is A0, A1, B0, B1. So the prior information they will have will not be about A0, A1, B0, B1, but they will have prior information about only the reliability. So in this case, is it appropriate to use the usual Bayesian framework in which you give model parameter specification under prior? So there are three types of prior that you can discuss. If my goal is to give a prior on the model parameter vector, which in the previous case was four dimensional, I can use a Laplace prior, which will take uh, some form of this type where I have absolute value. And uh, 
I have a theta g, which is for the gth group, gth parameter, and I have theta gh, which is my uh, prior specification. Or I can put a multivariate normal prior, in which case I can put the prior directly for the reliability function at uh, the model parameter theta. So I have a rih, and I have the prior or tau, tau i theta square, and that will correspond to the model parameter. But notice here that I am giving the prior for the whole parameter theta vector. But sometimes you can give prior just for the uh, reliability function. For example, the automobile dealer will know what percentage of cars uh, had a airbag failure before five year warranty expired. So in which case they will say we sold 1,830 cars out of which 32 of them have a airbag failure. So that's a prior on f of t. So in this particular case, f is always, f of tau i is always between zero and one. So we can give a beta prior, but not for the parameter theta, but we give beta prior for the reliability function itself. So the two, the priors on the top are for the model parameter, but the prior in the bottom is for the reliability function. How do you specify? The results you get can be dramatically different depending on how you set the priors. Here I give you, once again, the same example as before the simulation study. I have an exponential lifetime distribution. I have X naught, which is 2535, is the normal operating conditions for the two stress factors. And I have given the bias and the root mean square error of the Bayesian estimates of the model parameters. Remember how many model parameters I have? The exponential distribution as a scale parameter, only one parameter, but I have two stress factors. So I will have an intercept and two slopes. Those are E0, E1, E2. The true value we gave E1 and E2 to be the same. And we look at what happens to the bias and root mean square error. And you can notice some dramatic difference. And uh, the prior makes a huge difference. For example, if I used a, a normal prior or Laplace prior, for the parameter E0, I have a very large bias. You'd see here, I have 1.4 compared to minus six. That is something close to 25% bias. The normal case does not get rid of it. That has about 9% or 10% bias, 0.57. But if I had used the beta prior, which uses the prior on the reliability function, my bias of this parameter is considerably smaller. This is what I mentioned. So in a reliability experiment, the Bayesian elicitation, what format you get the prior makes a big difference. And you can also see how the estimates of uh, the mean and the reliability. You can see here the, the beta prior, which gives prior for the reliability function, results in almost unbiased estimate of the reliability at operating condition of 10. The true value is 0.799. I get here 0.804. That's almost equal. And I also have the standard error to be much smaller than the model prior specification. You can do the same for the other data, glass capacitors data, for gamma and Weibull lifetime distributions. I have two, uh, uh, three parameters because I will have two stress factors in a glass capacitors data. So the scale parameter and the shape parameter will have intercept and two slopes, A0, A1, A2, R0, R1, R2 for the gamma distribution and uh, Weibull distribution I have given here, those are the estimates and I have given different priors and it turns out that the prior specification makes a huge difference. And that is what I meant to say that the prior specification is important. Now, one of the things that comes across here is immediately you are worried about model misspecification because we have no model validation technique, no goodness of fit. You can very easily specify the lifetime model to be a wrong one. So the true distribution is A. The data ZA are observed. 
So you are observing data, Z data, from the true distribution A, but you don't know what the true distribution is. So you misspecify the distribution to be B, in which case my theta that I get for the, for the distribution B is a quasi-MLE because it is not the MLE of the true distribution. So that I denote by theta ABQ because it is a quasi-MLE, I actually minimize the minus log of the likelihood function under the wrongly specified model theta B, even though the data is observed from A. And by the way, this goes back to kullback libler divergence. This quasi-MLE actually minimizes the kullback libler di distance between the two distributions. There is a whole theory behind it. You can define the relative bias uh, of the estimator of the parameter of interest, phi. You can say, what is the estimate of the parameter phi of the true distribution when I wrongly fitted by the model B compared to what phi would have been if I used the correct distribution A? And this, you would expect it to be close to one. That means the model is quite robust. Minus one will bring it close to zero. And the coverage probability you can define similarly. You can use for example, the log likelihood based uh, information criteria, you can use an Akaiki information criteria, Bayesian information criteria to choose between the two models. Actually, you can do something more. You can use a specification test statistic, which is not often discussed. People usually talk about AIC and BIC, select the model with the minimum value. But in this particular case, what you can do you can actually specify a specification test statistic. So for example, if I look at the deviance between AIC G under gamma and the AIC Weibull, this is the quantity that I am looking at. And I can do resampling to find the critical value. I can ask based on the uh, specification test statistic, does the AIC support the gamma against the Weibull? In other words, you want to know whether it is significantly better than viable, et cetera. And uh, the specification test statistic that you use based on BIC or AIC will all turn out to be the same. And uh, uh, there is also another thing that we can do. Those of us who work on uh, multivariate count data, there is something called distance-based test statistic we can do. How do I do that? I assume a specific lifetime distribution. I test N, uh, Ni units, Ki units I test, Ni units fail. That is the observed number of failure. But if I assume a gamma distribution, once I estimate the model parameter, I can go and estimate F hat tau i. That is my MLE of the failure probability at inspection time tau i. I multiply by Ki the number of units that I test, absolute deviation will tell me whether it, the deviance is too large or small. If I do that, if the maximum turns out to be too large, that tells me that the distribution that I have assumed is not a valid model for the data. Now, this method has an advantage because you can calculate the exact p-value based on multinomial type argument. If I want the p-value, I ask, what is the probability the maximum of this test statistic exceeds the value m that I got for the present data? But that is a maximum bigger than m. So that tells me that if I take the complement, maximum is less than or equal to m. If the maximum is less than or equal to m, all the deviances should be less than or equal to m. Use the multinomial type argument you can immediately write the exact p-value. If the p-value is small, the reliability engineers usually use 5% or 10%. You can say that the data do not provide enough evidence towards the assumed model. The advantage of this method, it is exact, and it is easily implementable. In our book, we have given the R code for it. And here is what I have given here. Why the model misspecification study is important. You see the relative bias and root mean square error of the mean lifetime and the reliability at mission times. 
mission time of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and 40 years. K is the number of units that I test. Mean lifetime, what is the bias? That is what is produced. So what does this value 0.1613 mean? 0.1613 means that the true model is gamma, but I wrongly fitted a viable distribution. I end up estimating the mean lifetime 16% larger. 0.16 is the ratio. So that is 16% larger. And that's what that says. So here it is, for example, I look at the relative bias under the gamma model, actually I fit a gamma model. You notice here, the bias that I get is very small, 0 0.057. So that tells you that you end up making much more serious error. And the same thing holds for the reliability function. So the model misspecification is important. And I give you here the coverage probability of mean lifetime. So what you can do is before you estimate, you can use the model deviance criteria or distance-based statistic to test whether the assumed model is good or not. If it is suitable, then you go and construct a confidence interval. If you do that, you improve the coverage probability, which is what is mentioned here. So even if I test 50 items, which in reliability context is a large number, you never test 50 items. If I fit a confidence interval for the mean lifetime under the true assumed distribution and under the wrongly assumed distribution, you notice here that I have a lower coverage probability, but I can use the deviance criteria and then fit a confidence interval, the coverage probability gets close to the nominal interval. So that's an important point. And here I give you for the MICE data, the Berlin et al. study. I have the MLEs for exponential, two parameters. Gamma and Weibull will have a four parameters. Those are the intercept and slope for the scale, intercept and slope for the shape parameter. They cannot be compared because the distributions are different. And I have given here what is a maximized log likelihood value. The maximized log likelihood value under exponential turns out to be minus 294. AIC turns out to be 592. And I have given here the value of the exact value of M, which is the maximal deviance, absolute deviance statistic. And I have the exact P value. Remember that there is no approximation here. It is an exact P value. This seems to suggest, based on the deviance statistic, that the Weibull is a better fit for this Berlin et al. data. And that is also supported by the log likelihood AIC and BIC. And uh, the M value, you can calculate. The P value, you can calculate exactly. Now, one of the things that uh, the previous study showed is that if I use the wrong model, the data, the estimates can be quite sensitive. So it suggests that we can use a robustness idea here. One of the robustness alternative to likelihood test and likelihood estimate is what is called as WMDP uh, estimators, weighted minimum density power divergence estimators. They have similar properties as the MLEs. You can do uh, asymptotic test like score test, uh, et cetera, based on this. And what that is, is that it calculates the weighted power uh, density power divergence between the pi i theta, the pi i theta is what the proportion or the probabilities that you are interested in estimating. The probability of success in i different test condition and what you have estimated p i had, you set up a deviant statistic and you give a weight because the deviant statistic can be swayed by how many units I test. If k i is the number of units, k is the total number of units, I put a weight k i over k. If all the case are equal, then this will disappear. So the weight is important because you don't want your unit with small number of units tested as group to dominate those which were tested with a larger number of units. And then all you do is you use org min 
for this power divergence criteria and you can set up a EM algorithm which is done in our paper. There is a paper in IEEE transactions on reliability on this topic. And you can show that the asymptotic distribution of this robust estimator weighted, so that's what I say here, weighted minimum density power divergence estimator can be shown to be asymptotically normal and it is asymptotically unbiased and it has a root k consistency and you can actually use uh, the delta method to come up with a consistent estimate of the variance covariance matrix. And using that, we can develop a walled type test. The walled type test, you can do any parameter in a subset, theta e is in theta naught. For example, you can ask, are the scale parameters the same? Are the shape parameters of gamma the same, etc. Or you can ask, in the gamma family, is exponential reasonable? The shape parameter is one. So theta naught is some specified vector, and I want to test whether theta is in that subspace or theta is not in the subspace, and you can use walled type statistic, and you can show it as an asymptotic chi-square distribution. And here, I show you what is the significance level and the power of the walled type test. Of course, the significance level will get closer and closer to 0 0.05. You can, <coughs> as the sample size increases, the values get close to the nominal level. When the sample size is smaller, it will have a larger variability because we can use, we are using the asymptotic property. And uh, here is the power. You can notice that the power will become significantly higher when k increases. What is the advantage of this method? So here, I have taken the Zeeland's data and I have the exponential lifetime distribution. One thing I forgot to mention that all these procedures have a tuning parameter. The tuning constant is something that is up to you. It is omega. Omega is like a tuning parameter that we have to use. For example, in non-parametric density estimation, you have omega, smoothing parameter. We have to use the smoothing parameter so we can evaluate at different values of omega. There is a problem with the choice of omega. When the omega is small, it will get close to the maximum likelihood estimation. When the omega becomes large, it will protect you from outlying values or model departure. But we have to strike a balance between the two. If the omega is too small, it will have higher power, but only under the true model. When the omega is large, even if the true model is violated, you will have protection. But if the true model is the model that is correct, it will have a loss of power. So that is what is demonstrated here. The estimates can significantly differ depending on the choice of omega. So we have given a model valid, we have given a model validation method in our paper in IEEE transactions on reliability, where we have given a data-driven method for the particular choice of omega that is suitable for a given data. Now you can do other things. So far, I have talked about only a lifetime distribution. But remember, the stresses are in increasing order. I have temperature, nominal temperature of 20 degrees, but I test at 25 and 30. So I can think of proportional hazards model, in which case I think of the cumulative hazard function at time inspection time tau i to be some baseline at tau i times nu i, and the nu i links to the covariates. So I have j stress factors, so it will be e to the power summation yet j x i j, yet j are the model parameters which are coming from the proportional hazards model. We can immediately turn this cumulative hazard function to the estimate of the survival function or the reliability function, which is nothing but the reliability at time tau i under the proportional hazards model is the reliability at the baseline tau i to the power e to the power this. This is like an accelerated failure time model. <clears throat> and we can estimate. And here, 
I have given how the coverage probabilities and the average width looks like. You see here, there are two parameters, H1 and H2, and I have 30 units tested, 200 units tested, and I have 95% uh, using the uh, logit link function that I mentioned earlier, and the confidence interval seemed to maintain nominal confidence level, even with a small sample size of 30. So why is the need for larger sample size of 50 or 200? The precision improves. So the average width of the confidence interval with k equal to 30 is 0 0.076. With k equal to 200, it is 0 0.029. We can also estimate the reliability at nominal level. And you can see that the reliability estimates are very good. So now I come to the mice tumor toxicology data. The mice tumor toxicology data, Professor I have- Ebola. Yeah, uh, sorry. Professor Palakrishna, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to inform that uh, you have more, uh, five uh, more minutes. Okay, around five I will minutes. finish it okay? in five. Yeah, I will you, finish you it in five minutes. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Thank yeah. you very much. No problem. Uh, and uh, I have taken the exponential distribution here. I have taken the Bible distribution here, and I used the exact uh, maximum deviance statistic corresponding p-value it seems to suggest that the viable distribution is a reasonable model for this data. The p-value under the proportional hazards model says that the proportional hazards model is not reasonable for this data because the p-value is small. And I can fit in the MLEs and the confidence intervals, et cetera. And uh, now, uh, since I have run out of time, I am not going to go over the details but I want to give you a gist of what are all the other issues that have been tackled that you can find in the book. So far, I have talked about inference. I never talked about a design. How to design a one-shot device experiment? If you are going to use mice, mice are expensive, difficult to get, how many mice should I use and when to sacrifice them in order to maximize the information? This is called an optimal design with a budget. For example, you may have a budget of $300,000. And then in the lab experiment, they say that, well, I can do the test for 36 months. The termination time is 36 months or the termination time is 60 months. The budget is 300,000 or 500,000. How many mice I should test under what condition? And that is a question. And you can use an optimal design experiment by minimizing the asymptotic variance. And that is what is done here. And we show how the optimal design can be done. And there is a EM approach for its implementation. And uh, I have shown here that instead of budget based on time, instead somebody says budget is not a problem. I want a precise estimate. My standard deviation or at the termination time that I estimate the survival function should be less than or equal to 0.1. In which case, what is the corresponding budget you need? The expected cost of the experiment, and that can be studied. And uh, you can do a sensitivity analysis of optimal design. You notice here the optimal design is going to ask, what is the choice of the parameters? And that is a priori fixed. So. If I have several parameters, R0, R1, S0, S1, in my gamma one-shot device, I can change the parameter setting. What happens to the optimal design? What is its relative efficiency? The last column says, what is the relative efficiency? The frequency says, how many observations I should make? You will be surprised to see, even if I misspecify the parameters, the number of observations that I make are all the same. The variance efficiency is very close to one, 98 or 99%. That says that this EM-based, likelihood-based uh, optimal design construction is quite robust. You can do the same with a simple step stress accelerated life test. What that is, is if I think of a simple case, there are two stages, two inspection times, the stress level gets increased from one to two. This is what is the corresponding cumulative hazard function. It is like a piecewise 
as a function, you can do the same. You can develop a Fisher information based confidence intervals. You can talk about uh, optimal design. It is a paper in IEEE transactions on reliability. Now, I showed you one data where there were competing risks. This is the glaucoma data. Some died with glaucoma, some died due to other causes, some died due to both. In which case, I have number of devices or number of mice died with delta equal to zero, delta equal to one, delta equal to two. If both causes were present, only one cause was present, only the other cause was present, I can use a competing risk model. And you can do the same kind of study, Bayesian, non-Bayesian, classical, etc. This is done. Now, you can also introduce what is called as a masked failure mode. You do an autopsy of mice, you don't know what caused the death of the mice, in which case you do not know uh, what is the original cause. If a machine fails, I cannot pinpoint what exactly caused the failure. This is called masking. And you can use the EM algorithm to do the masked cause of failure data. The final point I want to make is some, there are a lot of people in Brazil in the statistical community who work with the multivariate model and copula based model, which also can be done here. I have talked about dependent components. For example, in an airbag, you have what is called as an ignition. The other one is called a chemical balance. Ignition is it sparks and then the chemical actually explodes. I don't know whether any of you have experienced a airbag explosion. It's a chemical explosion. In fact, you get burn marks on your chest like I did. So in this case, the failure can be any one of the two, either the chemical or the ignition, and they are dependent. You can use a copulas. For example, I have talked about copula models here. You can use different types of copulas, Gumbel, Hugart, copula, and you use typically Kendall Stahl as a measure of dependence. You can use Frank copula, and you can do the analysis. And I want to complete with uh, one particular uh, data analysis that I want to show. This is the data that I talked about, Berlin et al. This is uh, the case with the disease category A, uh, glaucoma, disease category B, other diseases, but both the diseases. And I have given here the inspection times, 100 days, 200 days, et cetera, for the mice. What is absence? What is the absence of A and B, absence of A, et cetera? And there are different models that are indicated different copulas. Whether you want to use the independence copula, that means the two causes are independent. You want to use the gumbel hugart copula or Frank copula, etc., and you can do model discrimination and model selection. So the final conclusion I want to say is that large sample sizes uh, facilitate precise estimation, and that's not a surprise for statisticians. It is better to use a flexible model rather than a particular model because the flexible model can direct you which one of the simpler model is better. And uh, that will facilitate accurate estimation using likelihood or Bayesian criteria. In the Bayesian criteria, the prior specification becomes important. But what the statisticians don't pay much attention to is good design. The reliability engineers always care about good design. How many units should I test? If the units are expensive, you can't go to a manufacturer and say, give me 200 units. Maybe that will cost $10 million. So you have to decide beforehand what criteria you should use, what are the constraints based on which you can develop good designs. So there are lots of future directions. If you read the last chapter of the book, there are many, many things that are given. We have handled only optimal design for a simple step stress level. How do you decide on optimal design for multiple stress level is something that we do not know. And uh, frailty models, which can accommodate heterogeneity between units that has not been done. And you can use a sea salt or an S salt, reliability engineers, prefer sometimes a sea salt, sometimes a S salt from an inferential point of view, which one is better? A comparison 
and some guidance is important. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for your patience to wait till the end. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Balakrishna, for uh, the talk. Uh, I will uh, ask if there are any questions. Então, eu pergunto se tem uh, perguntas para o professor Balakrishna, para os presentes. Uh, yes. I, I have some a few questions. Please. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for your nice presentation. <laughs> it's a very interesting subject. Uh, you had a very tragic accident to motivate for this problem. Correct. And uh, uh, how do you feel about that? Well, the, the thing is, the idea didn't come to me until I had the accident. And also, I told my student, if the other girl who had the accident with me, she was driving a Toyota Corolla, if her airbag had deployed, I would have never thought of this issue. And if her, since her airbag failed, I started thinking, how do, is it that my car airbag uh, succeeded and her car airbag failed? And my wife kept telling me that, oh, don't worry, you had a better car. I said, no. You, it has to be based on the reliability evaluation. So the reliability evaluation idea came to my mind from there. Then I started looking into the literature with Manho, and then we found some military test of the US armed forces had done the data on uh, electro explosive devices. And those data were sealed, we couldn't get. But one of the Chinese authors had published electro-explosive device data we used and started looking for other data sets. We came across about nine or 10 different data sets that are interesting. All these data sets are presented in the book. We have used different methods to analyze all of them. Oh, it was so a very tragic motivation. So the idea came purely from a practical motivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm very happy you talk about the basic analysis or problems. Uh, right. I have one question. Uh, did you use uh, 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 informative priors? We used informative priors. How do you get this information? Uh, this that's, information. The thing. Uh, that's the thing. We did, uh, uh, what we did for the informative prior is we did a simulation study. For example, in the simulation study, we know the true parameter. So what we did was, we set up a variance factor in the beta prior. The, so beta has two parameters, A and B. So we want the reliability to be estim estimated accurately. The reliability is A over A plus B. So we fix the true value. The variance is also a function of A and B. We made the variance larger to give a diffuse prior. We made the variance smaller to give a more informative prior we looked at what happens to the estimate of reliability. As you would guess, the informative prior results in better estimation. But in a practical data, like in the mice tumor data, it is very hard to get the prior. So the only thing we could do was the following. To compare with the Bayesian estimate, we took the true value to be the MLE values. So we fix that as the true parameter for my multivariate normal prior for the model parameter. Then we allowed the individual variability to produce diffuse prior or informative prior. We looked at the results. That's nice. Did you try no informative prior like Jeff's prior, for example? Uh, actually, one of the things that is present because is the non-informative prior, diffuse yes. prior. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. In the reliability case, it will be uh, uniform, zero to one. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we did the calculation for that. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you are going well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mrs. Lemar. Eu, eu, uh, eu just, I've just seen somebody raise a hand, I think, Alex yeah. Leao. 
um, if you if you want yes. to, yes, want to add yeah. something. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Bala. Thank It's you. Very, uh, I. I, I, I like it very much. Uh, uh, I, I would I would to I would like to see your your model in the context French model. Mm. Uh, uh, is this possible? Ah, actually, that is an ongoing work. Um, One of the things that we did is right now we have captured uh, the variability uh, inherently present in the units and we have assumed them to be the same uh, from unit to unit. So what we have done is we have developed uh, some results, uh, EM approach using marginal likelihood method where we have assumed unit to unit variability being captured by a frailty model and uh, the estimation of the frailty parameters becomes quite difficult in the marginal likelihood because uh, mm -hmm. we have to estimate that and that depends on what your sample size is, how many units we tested. In fact, we have just completed a paper on that. We started with a gamma frailty model Because in the gamma frailty model, uh, the Laplace transform is easy to work out from which we can calculate all the conditional expectations that we need for the implementation of the EM algorithm. It is a recently completed paper with one of my PhD students, uh, Chen Ji Yu, and this has been submitted for publication to the high impact journal called Reliability Engineering and system safety, and where we have done based on gamma frailty model. Of course, that raises, a, you brought an important question, that raises an important question as to how do I know whether the gamma frailty model is appropriate. So in the past, I have done some work in statistics in medicine with the survival data, where I come up with a more general frailty model called a generalized gamma frailty model, which includes exponential, gamma, Weibull, and log normal, then you can do model discrimination between the frailty models. And that is what uh, this PhD student is going to do next. That's an intended project, but she has finished the gamma frailty model work. And uh, development of EM algorithm, uh, asymptotic uh, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, etc. We have done all that there. And I understand. Uh, thank you, Professor Baba. Thank you very much for your question, Alex. É, se tiver alguém que se sente mais confortável de perguntar em português, não tem problema. Eu posso ajudar com a tr tradução, né? If uh, anybody wants. That's a good, that's saying, a good point. To... If somebody wants to ask the question in Portuguese, it's okay. <laughs> I, I have a question, but it can be English. I would like to know if you, in your book, do you have uh, the steps to sample from uh, the uh, this kind of data? I'm having some hard time trying to simulate the synthetic data using one-shot devices. Where can I find a good uh, reference to do the simulation? Well, uh, that is, uh, the R code is actually given in our book. We even gave a specification of how to simulate uh, from uh, how to simulate one-shot device data, and there is a simulation study, and the R code is given in the book itself. You can see in one page it's highlighted as an R code. It's a specification. What distribution you specify would determine how you want to do the simulation. What you have to do is fix what reliability you want at specific times, right? And there is not yeah. a unique choice for that. So what you do is you have to use trial and error to, if I want a 90% reliability at a 10, at a mission time 10, R10 should be 0.9. But under gamma and Weibull, with the different stress factors, there are many choices. So 
it tells you how to go about doing it. If I now take it from there, I want the reliability at mission time 20 to be 0.7. It puts more constraints. How to go about doing the simulation? Ah, great. Thank you, Professor. I'll take a look. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, good luck. I'm just trying to look if there <clears throat> if if there are other people that want to ask questions. Uh, I don't see if anybody raised a hand. Uh, eu estou tentando ver uh, para saber se tem outras pessoas que perguntaram uh, ou levantaram a mão, porque aqui no, no celular não consigo identificar onde tem que apertar para saber quem levantou a mão. Um, is there, is there some, uh, tem mais alguém que gostaria de perguntar algo em inglês ou em português? Is there somebody else? Um, in this case, uh, my question is a bit more, more general. Um, so I see that uh, it, uh, uh, it, it started with a, 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 a relative uh, dramatic event, this researcher, yeah? and I hope you said the, your, um, the other person, the young lady was seriously injured and I, I hope she recovered. Yeah? Yes, uh, later. actually we keep in touch because she was of my daughter's age. We went to mm -hmm. the hospital, I felt sorry for her because she mm -hmm. was of my daughter's age. When she was in the hospital, the police mm -hmm. came and charged her. They put a fine mm -hmm. on her and they gave her three demerit points. I was telling the police officer, you know, she is young. You can excuse mm -hmm. her. It's okay. And he said, no, your law is a law. And so mm -hmm. she got charged. And mm -hmm. I visited her in the hospital because she stayed in the hospital for two weeks because she had a back injury because mm -hmm. of airbag not a deployed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I hope she later uh, she recovered. Completely. She recovered well. Yes. Uh, yes. That's, that's good. So mm -hmm. in the end, um, uh, it, it seems everybody recovered that became really injured. Um, but I'm just curious: did this lead to some kind of project or um, uh, work together with auto manufacturers or airbag manufacturers? Um, did you uh, did it? Did it lead to some close cooperation in, on some projects until so, this point? Actually, one of my students has just joined General Motors last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is in Detroit. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, he is actually using some of these. You know that uh, uh, in General Motors, they produce uh, data. In fact, mm -hmm. what they do is they have deliberate collision so that they put a stationary object and they mm -hmm. accelerate at different speeds and mm -hmm. then they evaluate. The data is not only for airbags. The same data is also used for the strength of the bumper in the front, the bumper mm -hmm. in the back, how strong is it, how much of a dent occurs, etc. So they do that, the body collision mm -hmm. evaluation mm -hmm. as well as airbag. He is trying to implement uh, some of the technology that we have developed into the GM package. But the data, these collision data from GM, you cannot get them out. They don't release the information at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the only thing is, I know somebody by name Betty, and uh, she told me that there are data available, but they are confidential. We cannot release. But fortunately, my student has just joined their R&D and he is using it. And he even told me that Henry told me that even if they, if he writes a paper in the future, they have to fudge the data because they cannot display the real data. They have to change the data mm -hmm. so that you cannot infer from it the true data. Data confidentiality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. But um, yeah. I see that um, there is uh, some... Uh, uh, there have probably uh, come to life some projects of some work uh, or more closely if you your ex student here yeah, he joined general motors i oh. i was I, uh, I was born and grew up in germany and there the um, the adac which is a, a automobile global club they usually crash test every new car in germany oh. so they uh, crash cars all the time to test and they put a um uh, 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 um, uh, how, how do you call it? I forgot. Uh, it, it just like a, 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 um, 
of some kind of material, the, the person in there, and then they evaluate what the damage has been to the car, the person in there, sure. you know. And so, oh, by um, the way, there is one data which I didn't show. Uh, mm -hmm. That's nothing to do with a uh, one shot device, but mm -hmm. there is something called test uh, on dummies. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, dummy, what they, yeah, and they put a helmet. So, this is a famous data, helmet crushing data, and they mm -hmm. have a dummy, and the dummy is shot at at various speeds, various accelerations, how much of a damage occurs to the helmet, they, they mm -hmm. evaluate. And that data is available publicly. And it's a famous mm -hmm. data. It's called mm -hmm. the helmet uh, fracture data. But that's not typically one-shot device because you mm -hmm. can actually evaluate uh, how much of a damage occurred. It's not just zero or one. Helmet can be dented slightly, no dent at all, fractured like it broke into two halves etc you may get more information on it mm -hmm. i understand i understand yeah. of course um okay um if there are no more questions i uh, haven't seen anybody raise their hand yeah if if, if somebody uh, if i'm leaving somebody out please tell me um in this case i thank again uh, professor balakrishnan for the presentation today <laughs> it was a pleasure pleasure uh, thank you very much, and I'll give uh, I'll uh, give uh, the word back to Jeremias. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Professor Bala, for the for the talk and uh, the graduation program of mathematics in of uh, the Universidade Federal do Amazonas. Are grateful to accept the invitation to present this lecture and it's a pleasure for me to uh, participate of your lecture as well as see uh, friends like Professor Vera, Professor Josimar, Pedro and, and the others and I hope we can participate in Congress in, in person soon. Uh, I remember in 2019 uh, we participated of the WASA in Piracicaba. It's a pleasure to see True. you there. Yes. Thank you again. It was a nice visit to Piracicaba. I still remember. <laughs> thank you uh, again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope uh, the talk was of interest to some people. And uh, if anybody goes through it and they have questions, they want to work on it, any problems, please feel free to write to me. I'll be happy to uh, correspond. So my email okay. is very simple, bala at mcmaster.ca, and it will be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Bala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next See week. you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.